How many times have you entered an office building that looked like this? After making content about Art Deco architecture, one of the things I realized is how many people haven't seen it. More specifically, they haven't seen the interiors of these types of buildings, which is a real shame. So rather than focus exclusively on the history, today I'll walk you through one of the most famous Art Deco skyscrapers in North America and arguably the world, the Guardian Building in the Detroit Financial District. This is what it's like inside an Art Deco high-rise. Of course, we have to start with the lobby. One of the first things you'll see when you walk in is the mural behind the security desk. It's on the wall directly across from the main entrance, so it's hard to miss. But it used to be even easier to see, because originally, there wasn't a desk in front of it. The desk was added sometime after the building opened, though I'm not exactly sure when it happened. Still, the mural remains a crucial piece in setting the tone for what's to come. Primarily for two reasons. Its use of color, and what it represents. For now, we'll focus on the color. While it's typical for murals to be vibrant, nearly every part of the lobby could be described that way. Red, blue, and green are found everywhere in it, most notably on the ceiling. The entire ceiling is covered in custom-made tiles, courtesy of the Rookwood Pottery Company in Cincinnati, Ohio. What makes the ceiling so impressive isn't just that it's colorful, but the different patterns and shapes that are used throughout it. They work to create a large, cohesive pattern that's often compared to a Native American headdress, with the main part supposedly starting at the northern wall and the rest of it flowing across the ceiling. While I couldn't find anything from Wart Roland, the main architect for the building, confirming if this was truly a Native American headdress or not, there are many Native American motifs used throughout the building. Not to mention the Native American motifs used in his other building from that time, as well as their use in other Art Deco projects across the United States. There are many themes that appear in the lobby that will spot in other parts of the building, just in different forms. But color was the clear focus of this room, and the building as a whole. At this point, you might be wondering, why is it so colorful? In the 1920s, people were asking the same thing. Wirt Roland addressed this in an article just days before the building opened, stating, Because color is easily comprehended. Every material has inherent beauty of color, and every color under the sun has its value. We must recognize this as a universal principle. There are so many themes that we could focus on in just the lobby, but we do have more to see. So now it's time to walk through the gate to the other part of the ground floor. After walking up a small set of stairs, we enter what is now called the promenade, but was originally the main banking area. This used to be home to the Union Commerce National Bank and was where patrons went to talk to tellers to access their accounts. As you can probably notice, the colors are much more subdued in here compared to the lobby, mainly due to the use of different materials. But there are still many elements designed to catch your attention. At almost six stories tall, the mural on the back wall is the clearest example of this. It dominates the entire space, and it's one of the first things you see when you enter the room. The mural depicts a map of the lower peninsula of Michigan and its surrounding areas, with a woman in the center of it. Within the map are different markers representing what were the state's dominant industries at the time, as well as the regions they came from. Things like lumber, agriculture, and of course, manufacturing. Both this mural and the one in the lobby were done by the same artist, Ezra Winner. He poured tons of time and energy into this project, hand painting the entire multi-story mural. But that's not the only part of this room where painting shows up. All of the designs and patterns on the ceiling were hand painted as well, though not by Ezra Winner. It took a crew of 10 painters to complete it, with artist Anthony Eugenio stenciling and cutting out the designs as well as leading the crew. Painting the ceiling was challenging not only because of the time that it took, but because of the materials it's made of. It's made from layers of plaster, horsehair, and canvas, which might sound kind of strange, but it's specifically done to absorb sound 
because this was supposed to be a banking room, Eugenio and his crew were still able to make something amazing. And decades later in the 80s, it was his children and grandchildren that would restore his original work. The banking area has seen many changes over the years. The addition of these lights to the ceiling, the original windows being covered with tile, and the conversion from teller's desk to retail space. If the designs within this room are beautiful enough to make it all still feel special. And we haven't even talked about everything in here. Like the gate made of Monel metal. It was custom made for this building with all the different shapes and figures welded and cut into it. It's staggering on its own, but it's topped off with two Tiffany clocks, one facing the banking area and the other facing the lobby. These were the two main rooms that I wanted to focus on because they're the rooms that the public interacted with the most. Still, we'll look at a few other rooms to understand the function of this building. Our first trip outside the ground floor takes us to the sixth floor boardroom. This was where Union Trust, the company that commissioned the building, held many of its meetings. From here, you can see the other buildings in the Detroit Financial District, many of which were still here when the building opened in the 1920s. This room is full of examples of the detailed yet subtle work that was put into the building and provides a good opportunity to talk about the company that used to meet in here. Union Trust was founded in 1871, working in the Detroit financial sector with things like trust and land contract bonds. And to cement its legacy as an elite financial institution, the company wanted a world-class building to match it. This led to the building not only having an extravagant design, but subtle nods to Union Trust placed throughout it. Sadly, the company collapsed in 1933, only four years after the building opened and many of the callbacks to the company were lost through time, renovations, and different ownership changes. If you want a more in-depth look at the company's history, check out my video about the history of the Guardian building. Besides the callbacks to the company, the sixth floor is full of designs that you can spot nearly anywhere in the building. You may have already noticed, but the table, the walls, and the doorknobs on this level all have the same geometric shape. It also makes appearances in the window frames, the floors, and many more places. This shape, as well as the notched arch design, are used repeatedly throughout the building, showing how much Wirt Roland loved these shapes. The sixth floor boardroom is still used for meetings, except it's primarily for the Wayne County government, which currently owns the building. And I actually didn't have a lot of time in there because they were supposed to have a meeting. So that's going to be the end of our trip to this room. After our stop on the 6th floor, we're taking our journey all the way to the top. After hopping on the elevator, we go all the way up to the 32nd floor. In this room, we see more custom tiles, this time courtesy of Flint Fayance and Tile in Flint, Michigan. But even compared to the 6th floor, it's toned down somewhat. The room was cleared out when I was there because of renovations that were happening. I'm not sure what exactly was being worked on, but typically this area is used for events. Originally, it was the cafeteria for the employees. This room has been repurposed after the ownership changes and the original furniture was lost with it. Still the view from here is amazing, and it gets even better when we go to the roof. Only one floor up on the 33rd floor. This roof actually used to be an open air observation deck. The observation deck has been closed for many years and has been converted, though I'm not sure when exactly this took place. There are multiple landmarks you can see from here, like the Ambassador Bridge to the southwest, the Renaissance Center to the southeast, and the top of the Penobscot building slightly northwest of here. Not to mention that you can see an up close view of the brickwork on the Guardian building itself. What you can also notice from here is how the Guardian building has two towers. The one in front of us in this photo is on the northern end, and then there's a second one on the southern end. Up until the 1970s, the northern tower was actually the second tallest point in the city. That was until the completion of the Renaissance Center. Still, the view from here is amazing, 
so it's a real shame it's not available to the public. Well, that's going to do it for us here on the roof, and actually going to be the end of our tour as a whole. Yes, there are more rooms that I could cover, each with their own unique histories, but these were the main parts of the building that I wanted to talk about. If you enjoyed this style of content, leave a like or subscribe just to let me know. Having that sort of feedback is important to me, especially for the things that I want to do. But until the next video, I hope you're doing well, and I hope you have a good day.